Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Liam Zoller, your host for Fitted Health and Fitness Summit. Today, we've got a special treat. We've got Mal Huxter, a Buddhist monk, a psychologist, mindfulness coach, author, and, and author of works. He does workshops. He does a bunch of things helping out with our mindset. So that's the category we're focusing on today is our mindset. So welcome, Mal. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Nice to be here. So thank you very much. Why are so many people coming to see Mao Huxta in the mindset world? I think um, I mean, a lot of people come to see me mostly because they, they're not quite satisfied with their life. Mm -hmm. Things aren't going so well for them. Um, they're seeking something. They're seeking something. And I think what they're seeking is understanding and peace and happiness. So that's why they come to see me. And they come to see me for lots of different reasons. I mean, sometimes we can put diagnostic categories on it if you want. You know, sometimes people are experiencing anxiety. Sometimes they're experiencing depression or a mix of anxiety and depression. Sometimes they're experiencing relationship issues. Sometimes they're experiencing all sorts of different things. In summary, it is some sort of dissatisfaction. There is yeah. something that's not quite going right, or at least mm. they're starting to see how things are not going quite right for them. Mm. So they're experiencing some sort of discontent. And, yeah. and um, you mentioned I, I'm not a Buddhist monk now, but I was a Buddhist monk once upon a time. Mm. And once upon a time, uh, when I was a Buddhist monk, we used to use a term for this dissatisfaction. The term was dukkha. The term was dukkha. And it was, um, that's a Pali word. Uh, Pali is an ancient Indian language. And it, it literally means when an axle goes, well, the, the cut of the dukkha means a space in an axle of a wheel, the space that an axle of the wheel goes in. The dukkha of the dukkha means not quite right. So what we have is an axle and a wheel that's not quite the right fit. So you get this wobbly wheel. Yeah. And that's what we say dukkha is. It's like the wobbly wheel of life. It's sort of a sort of a dissatisfaction with things. And it can be really kind of gross. It can be like when people experience the difficulties associated with aging or sickness or death. But it can also be when they don't get what they want or get what they don't want or um, a part of from what they really, really like. It can also be when, you know, just things happen, like they're feeling stressed out or they're feeling really um, upset. Uh, it can have all these, these different connotations. So that's the main reason why people come to see me yeah. because uh, they've, they've heard of me and, well, they know that I'm a psychologist and they know that my job is to uh, help them find a way to a bit of genuine happiness. Hmm. So what... And talk help about us, right? Exactly right, yeah. So you talk about this dissatisfaction and it could come in different planes and it could come yeah. for something that we don't, we, we haven't experienced something that we want yet or we're experiencing more of what we don't want. So um, how do we prevent that or how do we get more of what we want or and prevent the things that we don't want in our life? Is it just inevitable or is there a way that we can uh, master that? Is it through meditation? Is it through certain strategies? What do you think? I, I, I did, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. I'll answer mm. that. But I, I just want to clarify about this getting what we want. Mm. And uh, sometimes, sometimes if we get what we want, we're not necessarily happy. I just want to make this kind of caveat. Um, yeah. There's been some research done on happiness, and there was a really cool uh, bit of conclusion they came to. And the conclusion was that across the world, uh, getting what you want may not necessarily bring you happiness. <laughs> and uh, it's not necessarily uh, a way of defining happiness. And they said, it's not necessarily getting what you want, but wanting what you already have that gives yeah, you okay. happiness. Yeah. It's a kind of, it's an interesting shift there. And you yeah. can see that the very wanting, you know, that very grasping after something, uh, it's different than desire, but this craving for something sometimes can lead to incredible suffering. 
we get mm. ourselves caught up in a bind. So there's a there's a difference between there's a difference between healthy desire and aspirations for something. Like I aspire to be healthy. I aspire to be um, I aspire to be wise. I aspire to be kind. All these aspirations are really helpful because they help me guide me on my path towards achieving that. Mm -hmm. But if I'm sort of sitting here craving, you know, craving the the next iPhone or you're craving a you know a particular uh, way I want my um, my family to relate to me or something like that, then oh, that's wow, a look, different wow, thing. Look. Yeah. It's inevitably dissatisfied. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I look. I'm I I'm I'm old. If I was saying I wish I looked like Liam, <laughs> I, I want to look like Liam because he's so young. It's not fair. He's young mm. and I'm old. I mean, if I imagine the more more I crave that, the more unhappy I'm going to be. But if I yeah. say to myself, yeah. okay, it would be nice to it would be nice to look good, but I'm not going to cling to that. It would be nice to look like look as handsome as Liam, but I'm oh, not going to cling to. <laughs> I'm not going to cling to that. Uh, rather, I'd sort of I might aspire to that. I might you know get my hair cut like Liam's cut his hair or something like that. But mm. I won't cling to it. And rather, I would look to see how wonderful I am already, how handsome I am already, see my good qualities. So I guess it's um, that's coming back to that rather than wanting something that isn't here being able to see what you can do and have an aspiration to go in a positive direction then that's much better it's an aspiration an aspiration isn't like craving for something it just sort of sets your direction if that yeah. makes sense yeah. Yeah. so now yeah. now you're talking about strategies towards happiness i think is that what you were saying or strategies yeah, towards yeah. just strategies towards you know uh, mainly towards preventing the things that we don't want but i guess by having this conversation you're making me think that it, sometimes we you know it doesn't doesn't matter if we get what we don't want as long as we're aspiring to to be you know to be living in a, that positive direction so you sort of answered it already <laughs> well look I, I, I can add to it we could you know i can talk i can talk all day on this but anyway look i'll 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 say I'll tell you one thing that I've uh, there's a little saying in a, a therapeutic approach called ACT. ACT ACT is a acronym for acceptance and commitment therapy. It's a it's a lovely little um, it's a very useful and practical approach to therapy. I'm a psychologist. I work with in therapy, and there's a saying, and it says something like this: If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you always got. Hmm. Right? You got that. So yeah. if I continue to create the cause for suffering or continue to create the cause for unhappiness, if I continue to do what I've been doing all the time to be miserable, then I'm going to continue to get misery. Yeah. But if I do something different, if I do something uh, that's not feeding into that cycle of and rut of, of dissatisfaction, then I'll get something different. Mm. So uh, coming back to the strategy, there is, there's no real beginning to it, but I was, I was talking to you earlier about like a wheel, like a, mm. um, a, a kind of some factors in the process of gaining wisdom or understanding. And I'll start with wisdom. And wisdom uh, is sort of knowing what is helpful and knowing what is not so helpful and being able to do what is helpful and not do what is unhelpful. That's my opinion. I mean. I mean, we can talk, there's a lot we can say about wisdom, but that's just one way I think about wisdom. Yeah. yeah. Then, so wisdom has kind of like an understanding in it, but also really helpful intentions. Mm -hmm. So you have this clear understanding of something, then that leads to making, it leads to you making a very good intention to act on your understanding. You know, it's like you might see yourself, you might see yourself in a pattern, a not so healthy pattern, like you might, uh, every Friday night, you might get blotter. You might go down to the pub and get drunk. So so drunk, you can't remember what happened. And you wake up the Saturday, next Saturday morning, you think, God, what happened there? <laughs> so 
you know, you don't feel so good about it and you have a lot of regrets about what you've done. Hmm. If you continue to go to the pub every, you know, Friday night and get, you know, binge on alcohol and get drunk and feel really crappy every day, that's, that's sort of setting up a habit and a pattern for you. So if you decide to do something different, you, it, it takes a bit of kind of resolve. You go, you come Friday, you say, no, I'm going to do something different tonight. I'm going to go to the pub and I'm only going to have uh, mineral water or something like that. Mm. And it'd be hard. It's kind of, it takes a, it takes a kind of firm resolve to do this. Mm. Then you, you do that. Then the, you, you act on your best intentions. With your understanding of seeing a pattern, you make a, a strong resolve or a strong intention to follow and do what is best in, for that direction then you act in a way that's consistent with your understanding and your best intention. So when you act in that way, you actually feel a lot better. Your mind is much more uh, composed and you're, you're healthier. Then you have a kind of a foundation to cultivate your mind, mm -hmm. cultivate your heart. And then what we do is you, you have kind of, we engage courageous energy Sometimes, sometimes energy is courageous because we have to face up to things that we may prefer to avoid. Mm. And sometimes it's um, it's in sort of inspiring. But either way, we have to have to engage some energy, and then we apply mindfulness, and then we allow our attention to settle and get really kind of focused on something. And when we do that, it's like understanding is clarified. It's like our minds get really clear. And um, we start to see the innate wisdom in our hearts. And we also yeah. see really wonderful qualities that we forgot about. There is an analogy I have here, and, um, and I've used it many times. Sometimes when we still our minds like that, uh, when we concentrate on something or get completely focused on something and our minds do still down, um, Sometimes we see the good qualities, but also we see crappy stuff as well. <laughs> Look, I, I was showing you before. I just yeah. told the yeah. audience that I was showing uh, Liam a little jar. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think it's a good way of describing something, right? Yeah, definitely. Now, so I agree. Can you, can you also, I agree. Yep. Can you see that? Yep. I, I'm going to take this jar up, and it's got a lot of it's got a lot of stuff in it, and you can't see anything right now, can you? It's sort of, well, no, you can see it's, it's kind of all cloudy. This jar, we, get, we can compare that to our mind. Mm. And our mind, sometimes we stir up our lives and our mind in a way that where we can't see anything clearly. Like we could act in ways that are really un, unhelpful for ourselves and others. We could be even harmful to ourselves and others by, you know, just being, just speaking badly or, uh, getting into negative habits and patterns. So our minds get stirred up and we can't really see anything. But if we stop, if we stop stirring it up, if we stop doing the things that are causing a lot of suffering for ourselves and others, if we stop harming ourselves, what happens if we stop shaking that up? It's like doing the behaviours that are in line with our best understanding and good intentions. Mm -hmm. What happens is our minds start to get really clear. They get mm -hmm. really settled. You can see that. You might be yeah. able to see that there's some kind of little, I don't know what they're called, like marbles or something in there. You yeah, can compare yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. You could compare that to your, um, like the jewels of your heart, the special treasures in your heart, like mm. wisdom and kindness and compassion mm. and um, patience and uh, fortitude and courage and all these different qualities that we often lose and we forget about. We discover those things, but. Sometimes we also discover um, things that we may not, we would rather avoid. And this, mm. I'm, I need to mention this uh, because uh, you've all, all got that really clear yep. mind. Yep. That was awesome. Uh, that was awesome. I, I need to mention this because I know that their mindfulness has got a lot of press about being a wonderful thing, you know, like the panacea for anxiety and depression and all sorts of things. But it's not. It's actually not. Mindfulness is just a tool. Yep. Um, what happens with mindfulness is we start to see things that we may not have previously seen. So we discover things like 
you know, wisdom and kindness and compassion, these things that are in our heart, um, courage and so on, that we may have forgotten about. But also we start to see things that are like not so helpful, things we prefer to forget. Like um, sometimes I use this analogy of a, a muddy pond mm. and we've, we've lost some precious jewels in a muddy pond and it's really, we can't see our precious jewels in the muddy pond or we, you know, our valuables. Mm. And what we do is we, rather than kind of dive around and search around in the pool, we sort of, we protect the pool from being, you know, other people jumping in and stirring it up and we let the sediment settle. And as the sediment settles, uh, the water gets really clear and we can start to see in the bottom of the pond. And as we're looking in the bottom of the pond, we still can't find our jewels, but we notice in the corner, you know, there's some broken bottles and rusty cans and um, sticks with nails in them and so on. And you think, wow, lucky I didn't jump in the pond and walk around kind of blind. Yeah. At least I know where they are now. I'll know not to step on them. And sometimes we can actually reach in and take them out of harm's way and put them somewhere out of mm. harm's way. And still we can't find our precious jewels. So we make a bit of inquiry. We start to look under the pebbles and look under the rocks and so on. And then we discover the, the precious jewels. So we can, we can bring them back into our possession. So the analogy here the analogy here is that the broken cans and uh, the, the rusty cans and broken bottles and rusty nails and all the rest of it are like things in our lives that we'd rather forget. Hmm. You know, that certain, some people have had a lot of trauma. We've all had something happen to us that, you know, has caused us pain and heartache. Hmm. Sometimes we'd rather forget those. And sometimes they're there and they're kind of acting in ways that are, uh, dangerous for us they're harmful for us sometimes we're where they cut us they cause us harm so when we settle our minds we can actually see those things as well and we can work with them hmm. and that's sometimes when people practice mindfulness and meditation uh, mindfulness and meditation is related mindfulness actually meditation is the combination of effort mindfulness which is remembering to be attentive and concentration which is this kind of gathering in of attention and settling it mm. so what happens when we do that our minds get really clear and we can see things then with wisdom we can do what we need to do if that makes sense yeah definitely so yeah so um coming back to that wheel that i was talking about that cycle when we understand something when we start to look at things and you know Look at them honestly, look at our patterns in our lives, see what's working and see what's not working. Then we have an intention, we, we have a resolve to, to work on doing that which is working, that which is helpful. That's like a decision. And we decide not to do that which is unhelpful. So that's yeah. another decision. So then we act in ways that are supportive of that. And then when we act in those ways, we have a sort of mental composure and a foundation for us to cultivate our mind and kind of look a bit deeper. And the meditation is that looking deeper. That meditation is the stilling of the mind and the heart. Uh, it's the calming of the heart and it's the discovery of our wisdom and yeah. our, um, you know, all our wonderful qualities. It's also being able to give us an opportunity to work with the stuff that's not so, not so good. You know, stuff that's been painful, which is actually, um, and that's another story. I can say that that's really good fuel for us to work with. But anyway, then we have wisdom and it sort of goes around in a circle. You can see how this works. Like, it's like a wheel that gathers momentum and you just keep on going. Yeah. And it gets more and more powerful. So uh, the strategies, well, I think part of the strategies are developing a bit of understanding, having a a good look at yourself, um, having a review of what's working and what's not working in your lives. If you're thinking about health and fitness, you look at what's causing you not to be healthy and look at what's causing you to be healthy mm. and you do more of what's causing you to be healthy yeah. and less of what's causing you to be unhealthy. 
then you can uh, you you get a, a state of mind that's clearer to see what works even better. Mm. So it's this um, the strategies that we use to meditate. Then uh, there's a whole range of them. And I was saying to you earlier, um, you can concentrate on almost anything. And sometimes people concentrate on destructive things, and that's not so helpful. Hmm. But if you concentrate and let your attention focus on something that's really helpful or, and not harmful, then it's possible that your mind will focus and you'll get into kind of a flow and you get really concentrated and you get this effect of a clear mind. You actually mm. get very, very present. Yeah. Um, I was saying to you earlier, there's a concept called flow, uh, which is sort of being in the zone. And you can mm. get into the zone with anything um, as long as it's not harming yourself or other people. Like uh, there's been research on this and people get into the flow, artists get into the flow, sports people get into the flow, surgeons get into the flow. In fact, we get into flow when we're doing something that's really meaningful for us and really interesting and really enjoyable. This helps us get into flow. And is that a form of meditation itself? Oh, yeah. I, I, you, if you look up, I mean, there's lots of different descriptions of meditation. And um, sorry about that. I'm just getting some photos of my grandson. Can I help Are you hearing that? You hearing yeah, little... yeah, that's okay. I'm on i on I'm on i photos and I, they often share photos with me, so it gives me a great sense of joy when I see my photographs of my son and grandson. Um, uh, so, um, what was I saying? What, what did you ask? Oh, I was just saying uh, you, you, meditation. It, it can be in many forms, and yeah, yeah just many forms. like. And it could be just yeah. through through. Doesn't have to be just sitting practice. Is that right? Yeah, or no, you can meditate right. during playing soccer as you were saying before as well is that yeah, right? yeah 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 there's um in the time of the buddha uh he traveled for 45 years he was a kind of he used to travel around he'd only stop three months of the year when it was raining uh but he would normally be be wandering around and teaching people and he'd be teaching them you know how to live a good life how to cultivate wisdom how to live a life that's non-harming Another way of describing that is an ethical life, hmm. uh, how to cultivate their attention. And he didn't sort of do a one size fits all for everyone. He would see the individual or the group of individuals and teach a particular way of cultivating this pathway that was suited to them, to their temperament. And so um, he told some basic, he taught some basic formal meditation practices. Well, lots of them actually, and some of them involve, well, they all involve being mindful and they all involve being concentrated on something. But what you do and what you're mindful of and what you're concentrated on varied. Mm. Uh, sometimes he would see people who were unable to sit and meditate. So he'd just tell them to be very attentive to what they're doing. Like, um, you know, they might be doing housework. Mm. They're very attentive to being housework, doing housework. And he would teach people that they could meditate in all postures, sitting, standing, walking, lying, uh, all different postures. So we come forward now 2,600 years. And, you know, I noticed when I was working with young people, um, I asked them when I'd ask, when I'd want to help them find a way of focusing their attention, I would generally ask them, what do they get into? What gives? What, is, what are they passionate about? What do they really enjoy? What really gets their attention? And uh, I was saying, saying to you, I was teaching a little, some kindy kids the other day, I actually kids aged six to seven, and also kids aged nine to, to nine and 10 to 11 in a school. I was just teaching them something about Buddhism actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started the class with ringing a bell. And then I asked them, why am I ringing the bell? And they said, oh, because we can concentrate on it. It's kind of, it's a nice sound. Mm. And I said, what happens when you concentrate? Oh, we get really calm. It feels really nice. I said, oh, that's, and you're clear. Do you get really clear? Yeah, yeah, we get really clear. And I said to them, what do you guys get into 
and we just went around the room and a lot of them said, I get into soccer or I get into dancing or I get into surfing. And I thought, well, these are all ways of meditating. Hmm. They're ways of uh, being able to focus our attention. I mean, weights is something. I noticed that when I do weights, not that I do weights very much, but I, <laughs> I, when I do do weights, it's like so strong a, uh, a stronger focus that I, I need to focus on it. I can really get into it. Hmm. So it's like it centers my attention on that. And when I can center my attention on something like that, it becomes like flow and all my worries and concerns drop away. My mind gets really clear. I mean, it, you, you can, you relate to that, don't you? Oh, definitely. oh definitely. Yeah, yeah. Just being you're, you're a footy player, and uh, you know, you're all sorts of you all sorts of sports, and yeah, you surf as well. I do a bit of surfing. Yeah, yeah. Surfing. I'm usually hanging with the seven-year-olds at the front in the whitewash, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm more more of a rugby league background, and and I've had a, a boxing fight. I spent spent a little bit of time doing a doing a boxing wow. fight. I did a marathon as well. So I tried to. Um, yeah, compete in different disciplines and and see what I just to test myself. I like I like to challenge myself in different formats and and uh, yeah, rugby was the biggest thing and that's a rugby league or we there's another another element like touch football or Oz tag. They're, they're games that are, that are definitely fly, find my flow state. I, I love I love to be involved in it um, and there's a there's an essence of concentration that as you were talking about before that I can't I. I can't find in other areas like you know some people can do it reading a book for example for you know and they can just sit there all day reading a book I could I could get on a footy field and play football all day and I you know obviously I would have fluctuations of energy but I, I could just I could I just immerse myself in it so um, yeah I can definitely agree with with finding finding that state and it's good that you shared that that light saying that you know, um, you know, that is a form of meditation, you know, doing, doing the things that you love doing, that it's an attentive state. So, a, yeah, state I, 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 just want to, I want to clarify it. Um, sometimes people get concentrated on things that will eventually cause harm to themselves or others. Mm. And that's, that's not necessarily a helpful concentration. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, like all sorts of, there's all sorts of things we can concentrate I notice sometimes when people get really worried and when they're miserable and anxious, it's like they're concentrating on their rumination. Mm. They're sort of stuck in a, in a concentrated focus on their worry and that actually pulls them down. So it's, yeah. not, it's not just the focus that brings clarity. It, you really have to choose what you're focusing on. The most, one of the most common objects of attention in um, in meditation practice is the breath because it can be it can be really calming it's a neutral object of, uh, of attention but also when you do slow breathing and which what hap which is what happens when you start to focus on your breathing as long as it doesn't trigger sort of anxiety which it does some with some people and I won't go into uh, talking about that right now but when you can when you can pay attention to something as simple as the breath it's quite neutral it's not harming anybody, then that forms a way of concentrating your mind. And there's an added bonus to it because physiologically, when you breathe out, breathe in and breathe out slowly and evenly, it uh, creates a kind of uh, a synchrony with heart rate variability, which is a sign of heart rate variability. A, a good heart rate variability is a sign of someone is really healthy psychologically and physically. Okay. Heart rate variability is when um, there's a variation between your beats. Uh, when we breathe in, our heart rate increases slightly. When we breathe out, it decreases slightly. So if we can breathe out more and have an extended breath, it actually serves to calm us down. An extended out breath, sorry. It serves to calm us down. And um, if we can become even with our in and out breath, and preferably slow, as slow as it's comfortable, breathing in, breathing out, it serves to really calm us down. Mm. And uh, it serves to, there's a synchrony between, um, yes, our breathing and our heart rate variability. And a good heart rate variability, a, a, synch a, synchron a synchronous heart rate variability 
is a sign of good health. So simply doing something like focusing on your breathing and endeavouring to slow it down and relaxing, you know, physically relaxing while you're slowing it down, that's a surefire way to become calm yep. and focused. It really, it's really, I mean, there's such a link between the body and mind. But anyway, I've gone on a bit of a tangent there because we, you asked a question about what you, what you can meditate on and, and I, I said it, it's important we don't, we don't necessarily concentrate on things that are really harmful. Like sometimes people do some really terrible things to other people and yeah. they need a concentration yeah. on that. Like you need to be very concentrated to, um, to be a sniper, for example. Mm. And, you, you know, you might be, or to rob a bank, you need to be very concentrated. Yeah. You actually need to be very mindful too yeah. to rob a bank. But it's yeah. not necessarily going to lead to great wisdom and, and insight. Exactly. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> Probably they end up wind you up in jail anyway. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry, Liam. I was uh, you had you had some other questions. Did, well, I just to... wanted to. I, I I'm I mainly wanted to ask that like we're living in a world now that you know that anxiety is is increasing. So it's I mean I think it's. The latest statistic is, you know, at some stage of their life, it's like fifty percent of people are, have some form of anxiety. So, you know, the, there's this essence of mindfulness, and you know, you are a clinical psycho, you are a psychologist, and you were a Buddhist monk. I mean, you've got so much knowledge and wisdom yourself. And so, what, what do you think that we can do to, as a whole, to try and uh, reduce these statistics once and for all? As, a, as like with it, well, you know, there's that saying, um, act locally. No, I can't remember the saying. What is it? Act, act locally, think globally. Think globally, yeah. act locally. That's, That's it. Think globally, yeah. act locally. It's That's the it. same. Um, I think it all begins with ourselves. You know, if you want to change the world, you begin by changing yourself. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and then you can think clearly to act in a way that is skillful. To change the world. Uh, last night I watched um, the Bentley Effect. Um, the Bentley Effect is about uh, the CSG movement in uh, this anti-CSG movement in in Lismore, and it was it was really wonderful because everyone did this uh, blockade of the CSG in the local area, and they did it peacefully. They did it without um, you know without any harm to anybody. They were working towards non-harm. So that was a way of kind of having a resolve and acting in a way, courageously acting in a way that is uh, uh, leading to wisdom and leading to kindness and leading to altruistic uh, kind of harmony. Mm. So if you're thinking about the global perspective, you act, you, 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 you begin to act on yourself. You begin to cultivate these qualities of courage and um, determination and resolve and um, fortitude and resilience and uh, balance and all sorts of all these wonderful qualities you begin with yourself then you're more able to act really effectively in doing good for the world and um, as far as anxiety goes I think I think it's sometimes people get confused hmm. you know there's a great great confusion in the world Actually, the, the cause of suffering, according to Buddhist psychology, is clinging and craving, grasping after pleasant experiences, mm. rejection, condemnation and hatred and ill will towards unpleasant experiences. Mm. Not, that, not that, we're, that we shouldn't avoid you know, things that aren't helpful. We should avoid that. But there's a, a kind of a rejection and a condemnation, that, an avoidance of, Things that we just don't want, don't want to know about, like pushing yeah. it away, hatefulness, and also another factor is just sort of not knowing, not seeing, not seeing clearly, not understanding things. So we get caught in cycles and patterns. So what can we do? Well, we can develop understanding. We can develop wisdom. We can develop uh, the opposite of grasping and clinging to things is to develop generosity, generosity of heart, generosity of um, generosity in your lives in general and the opposite to uh, 
aversion or hatred is to develop a, a kindness and compassion for oneself and others. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that so that's it basically. How yeah. what do yeah. we do? We do that, and when we do start to do that, it works in a way that our anxiety starts to get reduced. In fact, we become okay with our anxiety. It's like we're no longer struggling with it, we're no longer identifying with it, thinking that I'm a failure because I'm anxious. Mm. We're just saying, oh, it's just anxiety. Hello, anxiety, how are you? Mm. We're being really friendly to it. We're not rejecting it, we're not condemning it. We're just saying, oh, this is just anxiety. It's just mm. come about because of various causes and conditions. It's just the way it is. We don't need to take it personally. Yeah. And it, ironically, yeah. the anxiety reduces. But mm. it's it comes from a, a position of not sort of taking it on like a battle. It's not it's not like a battle. It's mm. sort of more like opening your heart and, and opening your mind to it and being willing to see it and understand it. And it's a, it's a, and it's a sense, sense of sense, sense of self awareness and a sense of acceptance, acceptance as well. Yeah, yeah. If you think of acceptance, though, um, acceptance isn't doesn't mean kind of agreeing with something. Hmm. Acceptance, in its deepest sense, means willingness to experience. Like hmm. we can only experience what we experience now. Now is the only time there is, and you know everything else is our mental creation, really. But um, what we do is we have this resistance to experience. We have a resistance to painful emotions. We have a resistance to uh, life. But life is, you know, life is going to give us, you know, ups and downs. We're going to have pain and pleasure. We're going to have loss and gain. You know, some people are going to praise us. Some people are going to blame us. There'll be moments of uh, complete social acceptance and social rejection. This is life. And um, so acceptance is Acceptance is something that I, I I like to think about as being willing to see things as they are, just willing to see them as they are. I mean, because the struggle against things as they are only makes matters worse. It doesn't mean you don't do anything about it, but, you know, there's, a, there's something in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's like um, people say, oh, I'm an alcoholic. They're just sort of accepting the fact that they're an alcoholic. I don't agree that they should identify with it, but it's an acceptance of the fact that, hey, right now I'm feeling anxious. Anx anxiety is here. Hmm. Just the willingness to see that clearly and open up to it rather than struggling with it and denying it. Hmm. Um, I think there was a, yeah, I, I won't go into other, on, on other tangents there, but. So, no, yeah. no, I actually wrote a, I wrote a book recently myself. It's going to be coming oh, out soon. It's called the the humble hero. I call it. Um, and, and it's and it, I touched on that a little bit on the book. And it's and, and I said it's uh, um, might not be the right analogy to use, but the chapter was clear the garbage. And and I, I like our sense now is that you know when I when I state that I'm I'm feeling anxious to my 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 loving partner Emily, I say to her if I'm Look, I'm feeling anxious today. Uh, as soon as I say it, it sort of reduces straight away. I know it sounds weird, but it just seems to reduce. And if I say it, if I admit it, like I'm, you know, I'm meant to come from a, a rugby league back, rugby league butch background. But if I say, look, I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling a bit afraid right now. You know, I'm feeling a bit scared. It, that seems to just, it actually just seems to diminish. You know, I mean, it seems to go Absolutely. away. So. You got it. That's that. That's that's. The essence of mindfulness. I'm going to give you a, a different. Uh, uh, I know there's a lot of definitions around mindfulness. There's a lot of um, descriptions around it, and it's a bit, it's a bit commodified at the moment. What I mean by that, commodified, it's become a commodity, like it's big business in some in some respects. So, but one way we can understand mindfulness, and I'm citing someone, uh, uh, a Buddhist monk here uh, called Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, remembering to be attentive to immediate experience with care and discernment. Remembering to be attentive to immediate experience, because that's the only experience there is, immediate, uh, here now, uh, with care and discernment. What we're doing there is we're clearly identifying that it's not mindfulness alone 
it's mindfulness connected with a whole path, a whole kind of, you know, that pathway I described before, you know, that mm -hmm. sequence of wisdom uh, and ethics and meditation or cultivation of or, uh, mental and emotional training. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a connection with that. You can't sort of divide it up. When we say care, it means you're coming at it with a, a quality of goodwill. Even if you're having goodwill towards anxiety, it's kind of a friendliness towards it. You're befriending yeah. it rather than it being your energy enemy. It's actually teaching you a lot, and it's yeah. the same with depression. Uh, this is it's this quality of goodwill and openness and kind of non clinging. Mm. You sort of you don't have to cling onto it. You don't have to take it personally. It's just a changing phenomena. Mm. I just look. I'll just say one thing. Um, People have a lot of painful emotions. And I, I got this little kind of summary of how to deal with painful emotions uh, from a course that I, I trained in and I teach uh, called Mindful Self-Compassion. And also, you know, you know, there's a number of other courses that I teach, uh, like cultivating emotional balance and so on. I bet they sort of summarize some really useful things to do for painful emotions. One of the summaries is um, to name it. Put a name to it. If you're having a painful emotion, name it. Mm. And it's like once you name it, it's like you get a bit of space. Mm. You get a bit of space from it. I mean, this is I mean, this is very much uh, the way we describe it in in uh, Buddhism in, as well. In fact, there's a there's a approach called labeling. You label something, and as soon as you can name it, you get a bit of objectivity about it. Mm. So you're not so entangled in it. So mm. What would be an example yeah. of naming it then? I might be I might be really worried and anxious. Mm. And like you said, you might just say, oh, I'm a little bit anxious right now. Mm. Anxiety is coming up. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Getting you name it, you sort of get curious about it. Mm. This is what mindfulness is about. The next step is to sort of feel it in your body because the body doesn't lie, the body is just here, the mind can lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can create all sorts of stories about this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the mind will go off on all sorts of tangents and proliferate, you know, go on, go on imaginary journeys about it and, and it'll build it up into something that it's not. Mm -hmm. If you can be willing to experience it in your body, it might be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it's still less likely to kind of proliferate. It's less likely to uh, turn like that idea of uh, making a, mount, uh, a molehill into a mountain or something like that, you know, mm. less likely to snowball, if that makes mm. sense. And then you apply something, and this is what I got from Mindful Self-Compassion. I really like this, these three terms. It's very American, but, you know, it's good. Soften, soothe, and allow. Mm. So you have a painful experience, you know, anxiety, whatever it is, you identify it. That's what it is. And as soon as you start to do that, you take it less personally, you're less caught up in it. Then you say, oh, how am I experiencing this? Huh, this is how I'm experiencing it. It's what and how. Mm. And then what you do is you soften, soothe and allow. Softening means kind of reducing your resistance to it, relaxing into it, like psychologically relaxing into it, mentally relaxing into it, sort of letting it be. Softening, soothing. You actually, you actually be kind to yourself. It's okay. Mm. You sort of, oh, I'm, a, I'm experiencing a little bit of pain right now. And you notice what I'm doing with my heart. Oh, you can't see that. You know, oh, I'm yeah, I can see it. Pain. I'm putting my hand on my heart. That's really yeah. nice. Actually, that, touching yourself like that or giving yourself a hug mm. actually accesses oxytocin. It stimulates okay. oxytocin. That's one of the ways oxytocin gets stimulated by touch and soft, soothing words. So oh, yeah. we do that to others. We do that to our children and we do it to our best friends. In this case, you can do it to yourself. Mm. Uh, and that will serve to soothe, soothe your reaction. So mm. we identify it. I'm having anxiety. Anxiety has arisen. You know, anxiety is here. Mm. Uh, we, we, um, we feel it in our body. We acknowledge it. Ah, where am I feeling it? So we're mm. hooking into it. Not hooking into it in a destructive sense. We're kind of getting clear on what's happening. 
Then we go soften, so it's a relax into it. Soothe, and we can use words like, it's okay. Just like you talk to your best friend. Like mm. when you're at the footy match and you're feeling a bit anxious and you, you say to your mate, I'm feeling a bit, or your mate says to you, I'm feeling a bit anxious. What are you going to say to him? Oh, you know, what are you going to say to him? Snap out of it. You're not going to yeah, say yeah, that. Yeah. Be like, all right, mate, it's okay. It's okay. See the mm. tone of your voice? It's really mm. kind of, it's okay. It's really kind of consoling. It's mm. the tone of the voice that's really important. Um, yep. Like babies don't respond to yelling voices. Mm. Uh, if you said to a baby, snap out of it when it's crying, it's just going to cry more. But if, mm. when you see a baby crying, the natural response for you is to pick up the baby, speak to it calmly and that's okay, no, no. even yeah. though they can't understand words, they're hearing it. And then you're also, you're touching it. These, this soothing voice and the touch stimulates oxytocin, which is a way of, um, actually oxytocin down-regulates cortisol, which is um, the, the stress hormone, which is what's happening with you in an anxiety response. The cortisol is going, cortisol is quite a good hormone actually, but uh, very, we need it. But in this case, the cortisol, cortisol is happening un, in an unwarranted mm. way. It doesn't need yeah. to be happening. So it down-regulates that. So soften, soothe, and allow. You know, let it be. Don't struggle with it because the yeah. struggle with it is going to make it worse. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of things there. I've been talking for a long time. Huh? Mate, that's fine. I mean, look, I was going to ask a question and any final words of wisdom, and I think this whole period of time has just been a, a consistent words of wisdom, so I don't really have to ask that question. Uh, my final question to you, is, Mal, is – now, where can we find you and where can, where can more people access uh, Mao Huckster? Oh, right. Um, well, I've I got a website. Um, you can download free meditations on the website. I do workshops every now and then. Um, I do, uh, what do I do? I, I run courses every now and then. I, I run courses in Lismore. I'm going to run a course in Byron Bay next year. Um, I, do, I, I do teach it in a place called APCAP. Um, Australian Association of Buddhist Psychotherapists and Counselors. I'm teaching a course with them. It's a two-year course. Uh, I'm teaching a workshop in Brisbane, but it's booked out uh, in a couple of weeks already awesome. on Mindful Compassion. Um, I haven't actually advertised my course in Byron Bay, but it, mm. the numbers are limited on that. It'll be a um, – I'm doing something every Saturday, every – two Saturdays, every – over four months, I'll be doing eight Saturdays, and people can come up um, the first two Saturdays of every month. I'll be doing a course, and people will be able to do a two Saturday workshop, or a one Saturday workshop, or attend the whole eight Saturdays as a progressive kind of course. So, awesome. yeah, I do that, and you know, I've written a book. Hold on, I'll yeah. show you my book. Give me two seconds. No worries. Oh, I can't find it. <laughs> so I've written a book. Uh, yeah. you, you can, it's called Healing the Heart and Mind with Mindfulness, but that's just focusing on mindfulness. Yeah. Um, Healing the Heart and Mind with Mindfulness, Ancient Path, Present Moment. I've written that. And you'd have to look up under, under Malcolm Huxter. It's not Mal Huxter in the book. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a few things. But the website is www.malhuxter.com. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure you type in the whole website because you'll get a whole range of other things if you just type in Mel Huxter. But yeah. if you go to the website, you go under guided meditations and you can download a whole range of different meditations. There's probably about, like I was saying before, probably about 70 guided meditations. They're all for free. So. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Malcolm. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to have you on board. Mm -hmm. A um, lot of words of wisdom there, and, and I think more people will be contacting you soon in regards to your workshops or your books. Uh, or yeah. <laughs> Let's hope so. Uh, your man of wisdom. Practice, uh, I'm, I'm pretty booked up in private practice. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you so much for your time. Okay.